All right. Welcome to the Occult Confessional. I think we're on episode eight. I'm here with Dalton today. Um, he connected um, with me uh, a couple days ago when I was looking for my next uh, guest on the Occult Confessional. Um, Dalton, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Absolutely. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to kind of tell us about your, your upbringing and how you got to where you are today? For sure. Um, it's a long and weird story. Um, my upbringing was, was pretty chill, but uh, my family was heavily Southern Baptist growing up, uh, especially my grandparents. So my, my mom and my dad split a lot of the duties of taking care of me when I was very young between them and my grandparents because they were working folks and um, my grandparents were more than willing to take on a little bit of the responsibility and bring me up a little bit. They were extremely involved in uh, their local church. My grandpa was a deacon for a long time. and He was the choir director. They were very much every Sunday um, hardline Bible thumping kind of people. So uh, on, on the weekends, I would stay with them a lot. And they, they were really good to me and they spoiled me. And they, I was an only child, so I was kind of the apple of their eye. But they also dragged me to church um, every Sunday that I, you know, so every weekend I'd stay with them, I can guarantee I was, I was going to church. And that was most weekends. And uh, it was, you know, when I was, when I was, very, when I was very small, I didn't mind it. It was just somewhere to be and some kids to play with. But as I sure. got older um, and I started to get involved in what, <laughs> what we called, you know, we had Sunday school, yeah. which was where you go and you learn some stuff uh, according to your kind of your age group. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we had what we called big church. <laughs> and it was church for big people, I guess. And that's where you would you would have the proper um you know, the preacher would, would get up and, and give a sermon and all that business. And so when I got old enough, they started regularly taking me to big church, getting yeah. the sermons, getting kind of the, um, getting indoctrinated, you know? Yeah. And uh, at a point that I can't quite put my finger on, it started to become very uncomfortable yeah. for me. And I felt like I was being forced into a decision of whether to go along with that or rebel and I was still very young. And I think that it just was easier for me to accept it at that time. Um, and so I, I accepted it up until I think I was probably about 13. Wow. My parents got divorced. Um, and that kind of brought a lot down for me. Yeah. And actually, I, I remember that when I would as a child, when I would pray, one thing I would, I would thank God for was, well, you know, if, if, if all of this other stuff goes wrong, I, I, I've still got a family. I've still got like this, this, this whole family that loves me. And I just felt like that was being completely shattered. Yeah. And it's, it planted the seeds for that teenage resentment and backlash against Christianity as a whole. And as a concept and then slowly started to bust open um how how crazy it seemed to me how crazy all of it seemed and and i felt like i had really been pretending all along that this stuff made sense and so i was just going along with it so your parents divorce was very much the catalyst for i think looking back it was I, I i don't think it was just this one moment you know where i went you know and i renounced christ yeah but it was kind of, I, I look back at that definitely being the beginning of the crack of, oh, well, maybe God doesn't um, want the best for me. Maybe he is not omnibenevolent. Yeah. Maybe there's a little more going on here. And I, and I think it wasn't, you know, it was just enough to, to cause that crack and the crack started to widen and widen. And it really started to widen when I got old enough to kind of drive because I started getting involved in a lot of like mu and music and, and, and playing punk rock with my friends and that led to getting exposed very early on to a lot of like pretty weird ideologies yeah um you know because that subculture does tend to be very into some some strange stuff i mean we're, um, we're, so, we're, we're a lot of us are like anarchists or marxists and stuff like that so right exactly yeah. so i so i went down that hole big time you know and i and i still you know still to this day <laughs> to this day um have a lot of that kind of internalized and I, I very much am you know um 
socialist. Well, I don't know if I'm a Marxist, but I'm definitely a socialist. So I, I thought um, about doing know. a project before this one called the gospel of punk rock, because I think, I think punk rock is extremely yeah. important. Um, I think that they have done a great job in most cases in, in expressing different ideology and counterpoints to the systems that we have going on today. Um, you go listen to an album by the band Mogwai called Come On Die Young. You'll hear a monologue from Iggy Pop cool. about punk rock at the very beginning of the album. And I want everyone, if you listen to this, go, go listen to that. And you tell me how the experience that Iggy Pop is describing there is different than the ecstatic experience that we have in witchcraft, because it's yeah. not, it's the same damn thing. Yeah. And watch an Iggy Pop performance um, where he's rolling around in glass and stuff. And you'll see some things that look, well, a li- little bit like shamanism to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, so you grew up in this Southern Baptist community um sounds like you went to Sunday school what I would call catechism when I was growing up um Catholic uh and your parents get divorced and then um you told me that there was a um growing up Baptist there was a very hard line drawn at black magic can you talk a little bit about that yeah for sure um yeah Southern Baptists are terrified of that shit Mm -hmm. um you say the word witchcraft and they automatically freak out that is a that is that is absolutely the worst thing you could be doing they'd rather you be doing heroin literally some of them uh it is interesting because southern baptism has a lot of weird peripheral folk magic kind of stuff stuck in there regionally um my grandpa's from north carolina and you know there was a certain amount of superstition to him i wouldn't say that i've seen him do exactly maybe anything that i would say is folk magic but i've seen him express superstitions that are certainly rooted in that kind of thing sure. and i know that it's you know there's there's still a lot of mysticism kind of worked into the folk ends of that religion but um yeah so it, it was weird where that line was drawn because um okay for instance my father was is is also very christian he was raised Southern Baptist as well. He's a gospel singer, you know, very devoted. Yeah. But there was a point in my youth where he started to, he was really into VHS tapes. And I basically grew up in a VHS store for the amount of, because I'm 34. So I grew up with VHS. So yeah, I'm, I'm 36. Would, would, I'm going to be 36. So yeah, absolutely. So you, so he would just record stuff off TV. And this is around the time that I, I noticed, you know, as a kid that discovery, um, uh, you know, and some of some of the TLC, maybe some of the other channels were around at that time were starting to play kind of like uh, haunted castles, oh, UFO yeah. documentaries, and he was really into that. And a show called Sightings okay. from the '90s, uh, which was a big that was a big one too. And all and so he started getting into this stuff, and I was just fucking fascinated, fascinated, enchanted by the idea always that there was something out there that he didn't belong to consensus reality um anything like that i was when i was a kid i was obsessed with sea monsters uh aliens anything that was kind of this unknown thing i was super into and my dad got uh these books that were um mysteries of the unknown they're time life books it was a collection and there were different volumes that kind of covered different um bits of the unknown cryptids but then there was some on magic. There was one on, on, on magic and I started reading it and uh, it felt very, felt very weird. And it felt like something I wasn't supposed to be reading. And I think even my dad felt a little bit weird and I was reading it and he kind of warned me. He's like, oh, don't, don't, don't get into that stuff. You know, you'll lose your soul doing that stuff, that, that, that kind of thing. But he was okay with me looking at it and he was okay with kind of opening those doors. And so it was a weird line. Yeah. Like between what was kind of like, well, and I didn't understand, like, well, what is witchcraft then? And I, honest to God, I don't, I didn't understand what witchcraft was until I was probably like 30. Because sure. even when I was, even when I was doing chaos magic and Thelema, like, I could give a shit about witchcraft. Yeah. I didn't know what it was. I just thought that it was, you know, the couple of hippie girls that I went to school with that said they were witches. And, and I just thought, oh, I don't know what y'all are doing. Y'all are just kind of playing make-believe. I had never had anyone recommend a witchcraft author or represent witchcraft as like a real thing. Um, I just thought it was kind of fantasy, honestly. I didn't have an overview of kind of like the whole of the occult. I just knew what I knew. 
I knew yeah. my pockets of it that I was into. That was it. And uh, so, yeah. I mean, was, but, but that's definitely how I fell into it, though. I think that's really funny because, like, when I was growing up in my early 20s, um, well, when we were in our early 20s, um, Wicca was the the predominant yeah type of magic um do, do, what do you call yourself like i'm a magician <laughs> right okay uh so i accept a few labels ideally i i i like wizard with a y okay um because i think and, and there's no reason for it beyond that i think the term wizard kicks ass and is super metal and it makes me think of black sabbath the wizard and just you know the cool wizard spray painted on some dude's van in the 60s it's evocative and i like it and i think that wizard warlock and witch for me are all just fine and they do mean maybe slightly different things to me but it's not um it's not they're not so different that i'm not okay with you just throwing any one of those at me yeah. which, which is the one that's easy for people to understand right that's fun and 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 uh warlock is the one where we get into some weirdness from the pagan community people think that it's it's a negative term and it's, it's people that betrayed their covens uh i'm not going to get into a whole thing about that but I am going to tell you to go check out an article by one of my favorite occultists, Storm Fairy Wolf, uh, called Crafting the Warlock, which is available on his website, fairywolf.com, I think, for free. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's much more accurate and more that I could tell you about the term and, and kind of a little bit of the history sure. and maybe why some people have a bad idea about it and they really shouldn't um so that's a whole nother thing but i do yeah wizard and warlock i like i do feel i'm a very masculine person i love pro wrestling and getting out in the woods and doing dude shit but i you know that's not the only side of me but i right. <laughs> i do embrace that though yeah and i and and so the, the more masculine tinged uh, titles tend to resonate more with me but i really don't i'm very i'm very uh laissez-faire about that occultist magician it's yeah. all cool with me because it's all true <laughs> so. yeah um can you tell me about grant morrison and the distant infocon uh speech yeah. that, that broke your mind open it sounds like <laughs> yeah i would love to this was probably the well it was one of the the biggest at least top three biggest moments for me of kind of like an awakening um yeah a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, his dad was was super into weird stuff, way weirder than my dad. He was he was into like punk rock and he was like a, a 50 year old dude at this time. And he was just an old head. Yeah. And he would burn DVDs off for us and kind of random stuff that he thought we would like. And some of it connected and some of it we did not like at all. But I don't know what possessed him to. I think he was just, the, the Disinfo brand was pretty big at the time. I think he had no idea who the fuck Grant Morrison was. But he had burned us the whole Disinfo con um, uh, on DVD. And so that was the first time I was getting exposed to not only Grant Morrison, but also Robert Anton Wilson. It was another huge influence on me. And that happened right at the same time. But anyway, so Grant Morrison is a Scottish comic book author. Yeah, that's how he I works, know him. Right. And that, and that is mostly his work. He's written one, uh, he's written a book that, that is very good. It's called Super Gods. That's a little bit about um, superheroes and how they are kind of archetypes and how they are kind of gods. Um, uh, so anyway, his comic book works definitely, you know, his primary output, but <laughs> the guy doesn't need much else because he's, he's teaching you the, the occult through parables sure. and stories, just like in the olden days. Um, and so this speech was just the first time I had ever heard anyone talk about the occult in such depth and with such a, um, it, it, it was really kind of like a lot of it was kind of like psych model stuff, but it was, but it was mixed in with, with all of this, the, these other wild experiences of him getting abducted by aliens and Kathmandu and, um, them showing him Alpha Centauri and, and, uh, and, all this crazy shit and it all made sense and i believe every fucking word he said and it just 
blew my mind to pieces hearing what he had to say about magic because he was getting down to like not just how uh you know one kind of magic works but he was breaking down like the whole thing in 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 this way that i i'd never heard before it was it was just chaos magic which is stripping away uh, a lot of the the flavor from kind of like a system a lot of the detail and getting down to the nitty-gritty of okay well how does this work why does this work and we can replicate that maybe without a lot of the um flair we can kind of just get down to the basic formula of how magic works we can strip away the rest and just see exactly how it's working and kind of do that through experimentation that's a lot of what he talked about and so he talked about so for chaos magic then would you say it is trying to extrapolate the formula rather than the reason behind the formula as long as it works yeah. it works yeah yeah I, I i think basically so um i think it's like this um i i think that uh belief is kind of what it boils down to and i think that uh well let me go a little actually bigger bigger picture here which is like we really uh have this hubris that we kind of like understand the universe and we kind of like that because we have consciousness what separates us from the animals right that yeah. ability to self-reflect and that greater capacity for consciousness we we really think we have a lot more of this shit figured out than we do right but listen to what 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 crowley said by 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 doing certain processes certain things happen and the student is earnestly warned against attributing objective validity to any of it okay and what 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 he's getting at is kind of like look we don't understand how any of this shit works this is all an experiment okay and so we know that certain things produce certain results sure we don't know why but we can get closer to the why the more experiments we perform sure but we need to be kind of detached from it kind of agnostic from it because the more connected to it we get the more dogmatic we get the more sure. stuck in the system we get and we don't need to do that so i'm very much uh, the, the core kind of, of of like my practice is is being humble um and doing a lot of experimentation because uh i like to pose this question too and i, I think this really gets to the heart of it um which is what is a spirit? What is a God? That's just a word we have for something. Absolutely. It's a word we, it's a word we have for, for say a current of energy because, and, and I'm going to say that I'm going to try to talk about this in the most operational language I can, because it gets extremely difficult to talk about. So I try to avoid is's and I tried to veer towards seems likes, um, because I don't know and no sure. one knows. Sure. Okay. So, um, it, it, it seems to me that um, there are these currents of energy and they sometimes intersect and overlap into different things. So if I say, uh, I, I'm a Hecatea, okay? And that's true, I am. Um, but I, I find personally, and I think a lot of practitioners find similar things, say like for me, Hecate blends into um, several other deities. Hecate blends into several other spirits. Well, okay, we can start with Hecate has three forms. Sure. So it's my opinion that it, it, it kind of looks like this. It's, it's Hecate doesn't have three forms. Hecate is a fractal. Hecate has three forms that all have three forms that all have three forms into infinity, creating the web of all things, see? So uh, I, I, I start kind of thinking of it like, that with every deity and they're all sort of overlapped on each other you can you can kind of tune into a particular energy channel for one of those things but what i'm dealing with with hecate might not be so distinct from what someone else is dealing with that's like lilith or a very another dark goddess energy and it's just part of it yeah right and it's just so it's just kind of it's all part of a rainbow and we have words to talk about them now and i don't want to take anything away from anyone with this kind of view sure i worship hecate and i even looking at it through a chaos magic lens i have to have complete faith 
and belief in Hecate for my magic with Hecate to have any effect. I can't sit here and say, oh, well, you know, Hecate is a kind of channel of energy and a thought form and all this. I do think that, but I also, when I'm doing ritual with Hecate, I'm entering a belief system of complete faith with Hecate. And I think we can do this with, that's kind of at the end of the day, the, the goal of chaos magic. And it's like what, what Timothy Leary would, would kind of use like changing TV channels for this analogy, which is just like to be able to jump from belief system to belief system. Now, one minute I can perform a Christian marriage and the next minute I can do a Hecatean ritual. And my belief that both of those things separately are, are totally real and totally yeah. valid. And I have yeah. total belief in both of them. Um, so you see what I'm kind of getting at there. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's, it's very, it's very difficult to, to kind of talk about um, in strict terms, but that's, uh, that's kind of the gist of how I look at all of this. And I, I think that, so when I, when I look at manifestation or I look at spell work, I do a lot of experimentation to try to figure out the mechanics of like, well, how does that work? I try to look at all the kind of variables. One is belief. One is the method of how I'm doing it. Am I doing a candle spell? Am I doing a water spell? Um, and you can go on down the line through a thousand different variables. It depends on what you want to look at. Uh, you want to look at planetary hours. You want to look at, um, you know, your mood that day. You kind of have to go through all these different things until you start narrowing down for you and your nervous system that all this is coming through, which is a very important thing we need to like think sure. about too, is we're a receiver. It's all coming a little different through our through our different through our, through our different nervous systems. That's why we have UG or UPG, right? That's that's it's it's a uh, what's true to you isn't necessarily true to me, but it works for both of us uh, because we're getting the same thing kind of through two different antennas. Um, so it's it's just not quite the same. Your experience isn't quite the same as mine. Um, yeah, that was the end of the the thought thing that I was on, and, and it stopped. I find I find that really interesting. So, for example, a lot of my a lot of my magic comes from a very Catholic place or a Christian place, um, much to the disdain of most <laughs> Catholics and Christians. Um, but I think it's really interesting that you say about like the idea of like receiving things from a different antenna, or um, or the fact that you said like, Oh, I could say a Christian marriage one day and then do this ritual for this being the next day. And yeah. to, to truly believe that both of those experiences are true and valid. Yeah. And definitely. one thing I found while exploring um, occultism in my early development period was in the grimoire tradition, especially the early grimoire tradition, we find, we find this very christian or jewish experience experienced through different avenues than the church or the synagogue it's not that they're not very similar it's not that they're not invalid and i don't think the the yeah. cultists writing those things like whoever wrote the lesser keys of solomon right i don't think they would invalidate the church i think right. they're very much just an extension or a different representation yeah. of that experience and they found it to be very true and it worked for them yeah and i think that that is one of the most beautiful things about a cult um, or the esoteric is that instead of being given this box that we're raised with and told like, this is it, is that we're able to experiment, like you said, or, yeah. or, or look down different <clears throat> avenues and find things that impact, impact us and give us results that we did not have growing up. And they are subjective, of course, because we are the ones experiencing them. But one of the most validating things is when you find somebody who's like, um, like, for example, my friend Katie and I both do um, Josephine McCarthy's like abyss work. And to say, like, it looks like this and then to be like, holy shit. Yeah, it fucking does. Like and to, for both of us to have this, like, rec recognize <laughs> that we have this kind of shared but separate experience is incredibly yes. powerful and beautiful. Yes. and validating because there i think the analytical part of me is always like i have experienced all these crazy things since stepping down this path part of me probably thinks i'm nuts and so when i find somebody 
who experiences the same things with similar results like that's oh, incredible yeah. like i don't know <laughs> absolutely Ver- verifying your own gnosis even with uh, just another person yeah um, and kind of seeing the venn diagram that results from y'all's experiences is, absolutely is, is wonderful yeah one of my favorite things that's 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 why i love connecting with other part of why i love connecting with other cultists right it's 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 beautiful um so 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 you early on after grant morrison you got into chaos magic how did that how did that shape your life like what were the results like how did you how did that impact the way that you live well um you know at the time it was more it impacted me intellectually more than anything because um I had a little trouble kind of like getting off the ground with magic. I think, I think a lot of that, and and I told you at the beginning, that's something I want to talk about was kind of like armchair um, magicians. And I, and, and that's something that I think I, I, I want to put a warning out with too about chaos magic um, is because this is the trap that I fell into. And this is part of how it affected me um, is that I got very lazy instantly is because I misinterpreted immediately what chaos magic really was. It took me a while to, you know, really um, get on with the full idea of what was being said in these books I was reading. Um, I took it very, I took it very much at face value and it, and it, and it let me know part of kind of like the, the danger of chaos magic is I, I think it's very easy for people to read and immediately extrapolate. I can do whatever the fuck I want. Um, that is absolutely not how it works as a matter of fact it's an extremely advanced thing because hopping from one belief system to another uh is fucking hard first of all you have to be able to commit to one belief system all 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 the way and that's already hard enough so um yeah chaos magic in that way is not easy and it's not particularly easy to understand when you are coming into occultism immediately to chaos magic you don't have any reference point you don't have Wicca as a reference point. Maybe no more than I watched the craft, right? So, um, so uh, I got, I did a couple sigils and I saw some results and I saw, okay, like magic works. And then it, you'd think that would be important enough to keep you engaged in doing it, but I didn't really. I started to kind of slide out of it, but I stayed reading it. And I was just kind of armchairing it for a long time. And I didn't understand. I thought I understood what I was doing. I did not understand what I was doing. I did not have enough experience. Um, at because all. of the practical aspect, right? Like you weren't, you were reading, but you weren't practicing. Exactly. Well, my practice, I did a few spells right off the bat. And that was it. I was like, oh, okay, I can do it. I, well, I'm a fucking master. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. I was a very full of myself. Had a lot of humbling experiences throughout my, my life that have brought me back down to reality. Yeah. But, um, you know, if it tells you anything, my first band just covered the entirety of What's the Story, Morning Glory by Oasis, and I fucking loved it. So that's the person I was as a kid and then <laughs> my 20s. Uh, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I just took a lot of, uh, I, I didn't really understand all of what I was reading immediately. I did, I, I sense of, we've gotten around to that, but, but then here's kind of what happened though, is I, I did keep reading and I worked my way around to Crowley and I started getting really into Crowley and reading Crowley and I was like, oh fuck, okay, like there's something here for me. So I want to kind of move over into being a fellow mine. And I was the a terrible fellow, <laughs> but um, I I. Do you think that had a lot to do with the fact that it was a system? The fact yeah, that yeah yeah it ha- it has to do with the fact that ritual magic and the the more the more uh, ceremonial end of things is not what I need. It does not resonate with who I am as a person. I really sure. need a more folk based kind of practice um, that resonates with me. I I, I just didn't realize um you know how how much to do there was there and i very quickly um suffered the consequences of of and and not just from uh doing you know lbrps or something but um from the rest of what was going on in my life at the time too which is a mess um i started having a lot of bouts of mental illness sure and anxiety and depression which which eventually led me out of my practice entirely for some time um and then i you know i eventually came back around obviously 
Um, but uh, I, I went through some interesting phases in between. There was a lot of shadow work there for several years. I got, um, I kind of made peace with uh, Christianity during that time. I know it is, here's, and the thing with Christianity is I have nothing against it. I don't like evangelical Christianity, right. obviously. Right, same. But, uh, I have no, I have no issue with that as a system anymore. I've gotten past all that and I actually got uh, certified as a minister so I could marry my friend's parents. <laughs> and so I've done a couple weddings now. Um, so I, you know, have to reconcile that <laughs> with myself too. Um, but yeah, so we're good with Christianity. It's not an issue, but I also know that that is not for me. Sure. And, and, and so, um, that was about as much as I knew for a little while there, I started getting back into reading and I started really feeling spiritual again around 2018 or so and it crept up on me and I didn't know what I was feeling or what was happening, but I had these, these urges to go out in my, in my yard to pick flowers and to come and kind of put them on this area, which is now my altar and, and to kind of uh, start doing these things, which I, I've quickly learned were just witchcraft. Yeah. I just thought it was be, it was kind of nice and spiritual. Um, but, uh, and then I, yeah, so I started, I started reading and, uh, I will, I will tell you how I stumbled into witchcraft in particular, uh, which is really interesting. When, when, it, when you say witchcraft, what, what do you mean by that? So like earlier you were talking about like you didn't know what that word meant. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows what that word means. First of all, every witchcraft book you will pick up is going to have three or four different definitions. But I will tell you the definition that I, I give sure. when I when I teach witchcraft, when I tell people about witchcraft, and it's it's pulled from a couple different sources, including Lori Cabot and, and Crowley, but this is my mishmash, and I think it, it matches it up as well as I can, which is, it is the art, science, and magic of causing change and conformity with will. Um, I think that there are a billion other definitions we can have culturally, contextually, and in many, many different ways, but for the purposes of, of, of functionality, that's how I will. That's how I will say it. Does that answer your question? So, so basically, the idea is that whatever you are doing is to become in conformity with your will. What what you would want? Yes, it just has to go through the 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 clauses of making sure we're doing it scientifically, um, as uh, as as a passion, as an art, um, and that we are doing magic, doing magic and spells i think is 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 part of it too sure i don't think you're a wish if you're not doing that yeah um so yeah yeah so yeah that that's pretty much how i'd put it okay. um i first started earnestly walking that path and getting into that path after i watched the first season of a show called hellier okay which i uh, was a. Uh, uh, a huge um, at the time. I, I it, it was part of my kind of pre witchcraft, like the, this this kind of feeling of being enchanted by the strange and and and, and things again. I, I was really into kind of like more like cryptids and hauntings and like just weird, you know, kind of paranormal adjacent stuff. And 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 I'd always been very into that, but I was getting a little more plugged in. So when the first season of Hellier dropped, I found it on YouTube because someone told me there was a, a show about the Kentucky Goblins and I'm, I'm in Southern Illinois, uh, which isn't too far from uh, Kelly Hopkinsville, which was where the, the Hopkinsville Goblin encounter happened uh, back in the, I think, 40s or 50s anyway. Uh, and that's a story I've always been obsessed with. And so I was like, oh, I, well, I got to watch the show. Well, spoiler, the whole show, not really about goblins. Um, fantastic show if you haven't go out and watch it but i need um, to i need to you, you do second, you're gonna it was actually working to me by the second episode i ever did for this show our third um it was with sarah and andrea from the two witches podcast and they both recommended hellier i have yet to watch it yes. but it's on my to watch list you're i think you'll have a great time with it especially season two i think some people don't um love season one as much i i loved it when it came out when it came out on youtube and on their website i i watched it very soon after it came out i was all about it and uh anyway so there's one of the one, one of the, the the people in the uh 
group of our documentarian protagonists in Hellier is um, a lady, a, a, a lovely woman by the name of Dana Newkirk, who I can't say enough good things about. Go follow her on all the things. She is easily findable. And uh, she and her husband, Greg, who is um, also um, kind of the main character of Hellier, <laughs> um, if you will, run a traveling museum of the paranormal and the occult and a wonderful Patreon attached to that. And they are just fantastic. But Dana is a hedge witch. And I didn't know what the fuck that meant. <laughs> and she was talking about it in the show. And I was like, what's a hedge witch? Do you live in a hedge? And so I started looking into that and reading about that, being fascinated by the idea of a hedge witch, which is someone with, you know, kind of the right in the hedge. They're, they're kind of like they got one foot in the other world and one foot in this world. And I was just like, what, you know, what on earth is this? What is witchcraft? And I started reading more and more and I got, uh, I started, so I started reading about it. And at first I, I kind of was like, oh, well, maybe I want to, maybe I want to read about Wicca. So I want to read, I, I just went out and read Scott Cunningham. And it gave me this, this aha moment of just like, well, it's like, that's what these people have been doing, really? Like, this is fucking cool. <laughs> I want to do that too. This sounds great. This is a yeah. real thing. And seeing kind of like, well, like what, what, a, what a witchcraft practice actually looks like, what that's good for, what that means. And I was just fascinated and I dove into it hard and started reading um, just voraciously, consuming podcasts voraciously. And I started getting uh, involved a little after I'd been practicing for a little bit there I decided I wanted to get some community so I got out on on Twitter and Instagram and let the world and all my friends know that I'm a weirdo <clears throat> now <laughs> and uh, I, I restarted my Twitter um, I, I was part of theology Twitter before I became part of, a car, part of a cult Twitter and when I made that major change I just pleaded my old one and started a new one because I'd already created um a world that I operated in and it was very largely in philosophy or theology. And if I were to try to add a call Twitter to that, it would have been this big. So, so I just canceled um, everything and started yeah. and found an entire community of people I can talk to that exactly. don't think I'm crazy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I came from my last community. It was a pro wrestling community. So I obviously wasn't going to, crossover from that right uh, so uh, i feel you though it's it, it's just yeah and, and i can't say enough though honestly i want to just take a minute to like shout out the twitter community right now yeah because like man i i'm i'm here to tell you i've had a lot of i had a lot of interests i've been a part of a lot of uh subcultures and communities mm -hmm. and i'm just gonna say it bar none this is the best online community i've ever been a part of Same. i i within i think it was like <laughs> maybe the first month i was here i i made some really offhand post about how i didn't know a plant like i'm a bad witch you know and i had witches like 20 30 people be like i will mail you a plant yeah and i was just like what the yeah fuck? uh i've never experienced that kind of shit online or really almost in life it's it's remarkable witches are fucking wild occultists are are some of the most generous kind cool people and the online community really kicks ass i know there's a lot of drama and shit in the sure. online community all the time but fuck that look look at all the good look at all the connection and i've i've met so many cool people and i wouldn't be here right now if it weren't for it talking to you and no just absolutely. getting getting to connect you know so no, um, no twitter has been super important to me um i've had friends that i've never met in person but i've literally talked to on the phone and through twitter for over a decade um yeah. and who are very much a part of my life and people who i love um and it's been i think an incredible platform to connect with people that we do not otherwise have access to within our direct community at least not openly um a lot of people talk about the broom closet um <laughs> like i i think that we are able to create these micro communities that we are very much able to shape and follow people who share similar interests or, or adjacent interests and right. help us have a better understanding of the greater world around us, which I think is beautiful. Um, yes. But this platform over the past decade or so has been incredible as far as connecting with people 
that I would not have been able to connect to with otherwise. And I agree with you. It's, it's an totally. incredibly beautiful thing. When I, when I switched over to a cult Twitter, um, it was this very, very welcoming community. Um, <clears throat> a, a woman, Gabrielle, that I actually talked to this past Tuesday, um, she was one of the first people to welcome me into this community when I first started and like, I'll never forget her because she was that person. You know what I mean? Like, it's, yes, it's, it's wild. Absolutely. I, I, I have a couple of those too. Viv was one. Um, Viv is good people. Yeah. Viv's fucking awesome. She was one of the first people that I really talked to very much on here and it's not anybody stick super close or anything, but like, you know, we just exchange little, uh, little likes and stuff. And it's just, it's, it's, you know, yes. it's, it's just nice. It's just nice to be able to connect with people and just kind of like to see, like, I see you yeah it's awesome it's awesome (laughs) uh katie swallow on twitter um if you don't follow her as one of those people she's a mccarthyan um and outside my outside my partner i don't know anyone else who reads josephine mccarthy besides katie so it's been pretty phenomenal um one thing that you said you want to talk about um was water can you can you tell me about how that is part of your practice and how how important that is to you um, yes. Well, I consider myself a, 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 a water wizard by, by, by some point. Um, so I will, I'll, I'll tell you some of my kind of formative experiences and how it kind of like folded out for me, sure. um, which was my, 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 my grandfather was a water, witch in, in, in the sense of that he, he could find water with, with dowsing. Um, not, not the same, uh, thing that I'm doing at all, but I had some really interesting experiences with him kind of mystical as a kid of, a him going out and he would, he would take branches from a certain tree and to this day. I can't remember what kind, what tree he said, uh, but he would go out with these, uh, you know, his, his two, his two dowsing sticks and he would douse for water. And I, I, I saw those sticks, not just go towards the ground, cross, but I mean, come down to the ground with such force that they would, the bark would crack off. That's wild. And I I don't think I understood quite what I was seeing, you know? I I knew it was a little extraordinary, but now it's dead as magic. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Literally, so, uh, and yeah, you know, sure enough, we dig down a little and there's your water and it just, uh, that was wild. So, so, uh, I am a, I'm a Pisces. I, 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 I move in water better than I move on land. I was obsessed with water as a kid. I used to go down to the Creek and, uh, play constantly. I had a kind of, kind of some woods in my backyard. Yeah. Uh, you couldn't, couldn't keep me out of the pool. I just I always, always had this connection with water and water has always felt mystical. And I've, I've had so many weird experiences of, uh, you know, we, we, we moved to this place when I was a kid and I walked down these trails out back and I discovered this, what to me was a hidden lake. It was a pond, it was a pond, (laughs) just a little pond, a little runoff pond. Uh, but to me it was a lake and I discovered it and it just was, it was so mystical, you know, and, and and I, so just all these kind of like weird, you know, just, just, just this numinous feeling around water, um, all my life. And then getting involved in, in witchcraft and very serendipitously finding um, Anwen Avalon. This is her book, Water Witchcraft. She has another one called Way of the Water Priestess. Um, and I instantly connected with it just in, in it just so hard. It just slotted right in with, with what I needed at that time, and, which has been a theme I found with my whole witchcraft journey is things find Same. me right when I need them. They Absolutely. find me right when I need them. Yeah. And it's, it's wonderful how that happens. So this book found me when I needed it. And it's very Celtic based. And um, that is very much my, my, my ancestry. And it was kind of what I was looking into at the time. And it, it was just too perfect. And um, so I started adapting a lot of the practices uh, from this book and also uh, from uh, some of the information I got from a book called Wished Waters by Jim McGarry. Uh, which is a wonderful resource, a little hard to find, but um, if you can find a copy, it's fantastic. Um, and I started adapting a lot of those practices, which uh, what, it, what it looks like for me is that I have a working relationship with uh, River Spirit and um, some, some, some other spirits of, from my local Cree and a couple local other bodies of water that I work with. And they've allowed me to uh, collect water from them for various purposes. 
Um, and so I have some different kinds of holy water that I use for different things. Um, I have sacred vessels, which I've um, consecrated using um, said water in the name of said spirits. Um, and I, I use these to do my work, um, which involves making a lot of blessed and enchanted water. Um, it involves a lot of acts of, of, of pouring water in, in various increments into various vessels with very with intent tied to it. Sure. Um, I also, I work in service to the water. So I regularly go and I clean the waters and I clean the shores and I honor the spirits there by doing that work as well. Um, and so uh, I, I, I think that, um, that we should be more conscious of how we treat water and kind of our respect for water as practitioners. Um, we, we need there's there's a very real need right now to to protect waters look at what was happening in flint and and i, I grew up there, look at yeah. oh god yeah. yeah well there you go so i don't need to stress it to you um there's you know i i i don't need to explain here how badly yeah uh our relationship as human beings is to the waters of this world and i would just ask everyone to especially um, occultists and, and, and witches and witches and nature-based practitioners, you know, I think that we look a lot at plants and, 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 we, and we do look a lot at the environment, but I would like us to put our eyes a little more on water because we kind of need it to live. And uh, it's very, very important. And, and I think that we could do more work for water. And I think that one thing that would make us want to do more work for water would be to work more with water and i think that we need more water which is because there is a world of uh practical application through spell work application absolutely um, with just water and the just the tap water that comes from your home even because you know, I, that's a very powerful spirit of place yeah um and 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 it, it, it's just something i i always um if I'm, if I'm doing anything public, I, I always try to kind of, it's, 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 uh, this is my evangelism. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. That's, that's, that's the right evangelism, right? As I, um. as I have to, I have to advocate for the spirits of water because I serve them. So. Water is very important to my personal practice of exorcist and a cleanser. Um, I, yes. I work a lot with consecrated water. Um, at the last house that I took care of, I consecrated every single flowing line of water in their house. Um, and it's, it's like, I don't think that people like from a scientific standpoint, water is very much the most important thing that we can possibly consume. Our bodies are, are mostly water. We need yes. to replenish that. Um, and we need access to clean water, which is super important. Um, one thing that I think is super beautiful is you were talking about just even cleaning up like the waterfront where you, yes. where you go. And, and, and you're, when you said you're in service to those spirits and I was like, what does that mean? But then you were like, no, I literally go and clean up those areas. We can do a lot as human beings, not only with the water, but our environment. I think that as a cultist or which is in any aspect, we should be environmental activists. Um, yes. We, we should be on the, the front lines of like the global warming knowledge and, and taking care of our environment and things like that. So that I think is super beautiful and super important. Um, yes that that's incredibly beautiful well thank you i i do I, I i do i think it's very very important just to um you know we work with these spirits i work with water spirits i i, I have to find you know there, there has to be respect there yeah um and you know, it's a two-way street if i'm going to ask them to do for me I, I i need to do for them and i'll tell you that going down and cleaning the waterfront is a much more appreciated offering to a water spirit Right. Then, uh, hey, here's a Trisket. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't. Okay, it's about it's about energy <laughs> and meaning, right? So I just, you know, um, form fucking relationships with the spirits you work with. Absolutely, is what I would tell people. Um, they're they're just like you. They need things and they want things, and they're gonna appreciate real effort more than they are going to something just fucking symbolic. Um, so just think about that, you know, put, put a little energy in and they'll put energy in for you, but you gotta, you gotta do your legwork too. Spirits need you as, as well. Right. So 
So uh, just think about that. You're you're here in the physical world, and then and they're not. They're in the spirit realm. Right. There are things that you can do very easily for them that they can, and they appreciate that shit, and they will work for you if you'll work for them. So that, that's that. <laughs> yeah, I was talking with Leo. Well, you watched that um, episode yeah, with Leo. Yeah, did. And um, one thing that I can't stress enough is the fact that I'm very anti-binding of any type of being. Um, yeah. Because I feel that relationship is very important. I, I think that there are a lot of people who use that yeah. type of technique for whatever reason i'm like i'd rather work with someone who wants to cooperate with me than someone i'm forcing to cooperate with me um percent one thing i think about is that we i don't think most occultists would wish that we still had forms of slavery <laughs> or indentured right. service you. so or, why, or, so why you would you do that yeah why would you do that to a metaphysical being um yeah. and Joseph McCarthy was very much influential in that. My growing up as liberal Catholic was very influential in that. Like I, I, I know a lot of conservative Catholics. I'm like, I don't know how you got there because I grew up in this liberal Catholic family, so I have no idea what the hell's going on. Whole uh, thing is, or, or like the Southern Baptist Convention, for example. Like I don't know what's going on. How how you get there? Um, yeah. But like working in cooperation, not only with other human beings, but with the the deities or angels or spirits that you work with, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important. And I can't stress that enough to anybody watching this. That, yeah. That like you said, if they're willing to give something to us, we should be willing to give something in return. Yeah. Just like any other it's, possible relationship that we have. Yes. It's, it's respect and it's the yeah. heart of this work. Um, you know, you can, you can do a candle spell and, and get something and that's all great. But, but let me tell you, if you guys, a uh, some some spirits you formed a relationship working with right. you you can, get, you can get some stuff done yeah that's a new level and you don't know until you you do it so i'm going to say if you if you don't get you know this involved anyone watching this if you don't get involved that involved in your practice i want you to go out and try it and then see what happens when it's, you work with those spirits <laughs> i think what's really interesting is that i never did it the other way um so like my first experience with saint michael was over a decade ago and since then, I've been cooperating with St. Michael. Someone goes, what does it feel like to worship some, someone like St. Michael? I'm like, I don't worship St. Michael. I work with right. St. Michael. Right. Big <laughs> distinction. Like, they're like, big distinction. I was like, I was like, I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. So I don't yes. know. What, what does it mean to like just <laughs> bend his back and call? I'm like, I don't bend his back and call. Like we're cooperative yeah. type of thing. I, That's not it. <laughs> I've never said no to what he, what I've been asked to do, but mm -hmm. I've never felt the need to say no. And I've never felt threatened if to the point where like, what if I were to say no, what would happen? Or like blackmail. Yeah. Something. Like right. I've never, I've never, yeah, I've never yeah. felt that coercion. Um, yeah. So like, I, yeah, I mean, just like, just like anyone that I talk to as a human being, I want to establish a relationship with them as a friend or a coworker or a neighbor. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like we need to think about spirit work and deity work like that. No, definitely. And I think, um, yeah, it's something that I do too. Is I, I help people with with negative entities in their in their homes and stuff sometimes, and they yeah. always expect I'm gonna, you know, come, well, get out of here! I command you, yeah, get out of this home. And and that's not it, fucking at all. First of all, this might be something that's land based, and I'm just torturing it like a lion in a cage. Right. I have to figure out what the fuck I'm dealing with first, and then we can start negotiating. Right. But like, yeah, I mean, and, and it goes back to what I was saying is how we don't really understand the ultimate, true, objective nature of these things. Right. We, have, we, we get as much as we can through our, our, our little nervous system, and we understand as much as we can interact in the ways we can. So you really, why would you be mean to something that you don't even really understand? Right fully that just that's dangerous and cruel and, and it just doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to me uh, I, I so, always tell people yeah. that demons and parasites don't need to be like damned to hell they just need to go back to where they belong it, yeah and, that's exactly and, and it's it. like it's like right. some, sometimes people get like misplaced or put there by other people and and i just think and give them the same courtesy that you would want if you found yourself misplaced right you know would you want to be cast out into the hell or whatever it is they do yeah no, just you know it's like it's like finding an insect inside what's not supposed to be well you can Absolutely. smash the motherfucker or you can let it back outside where it goes right and, and and yeah i think it comes down um a little bit to people think it's easier just to fork something out they think it's easy it's not 
No, but I, I think mean, it's you know. I mean, if I mean, growing up Southern Baptist, I'm sure you're familiar with like Deliverance Ministry, um, oh, which yeah. is a horrifying <laughs> type of prayer ritual to kind of deliver somebody out of the way of possession. And Catholic exorcism is also a very violent, I believe, very unnecessarily so type mm-hmm. of process and for people who are not familiar with those things you can go on youtube or pretty much google it and you can see how how unnecessarily violent either of those practices are in a lot of cases and it's very much because you are trying to like literally pry something out and get it the fuck out of there as opposed to working with what's going on understanding what it is and yeah. putting it back where it belongs um it doesn't need to be that painful nope. uh, like not at all People um, think it's going to be a fight uh, because one, I think that kind of our reality, everything's based kind of on like opposition, war, war games. Right. Everyone automatically goes there, but also everyone's seen the fucking exorcist. Right. Which is a horrifying movie when I think about what it would mean to take care of something like that. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's, that's incredibly powerful. Um, is there anything else that you want to clarify about armchair occultism or chaos magic? Um, yeah, I don't think I really have uh, a whole lot more to say on either of those things other than kind of just like my personal, I would say, do, you know, don't do, do things, get out there and do things. Um, if you're listening to this and you even consider the possibility that you might be an armchair magician, then go do some spells. Um, they're not gonna, you know, nothing bad's gonna happen. Um, it's, it's just experiment, experiment and be fearless. Don't, I mean, don't do anything super dumb but use common sense, use safety, put up your protections, but experiment and don't be afraid to do that. Um, and uh, I would also say if we're, if you're confused about chaos magic, if you're feeling lost uh, or you just want some more insight on chaos magic as a paradigm, I would, I would say go out and grab the book Condensed Chaos by Phil Hine. It's a classic for a reason. It's just came out on audiobook, I do believe as well. So you can do it the lazy way or the the convenient way as you'd have it um uh but yeah i think um you know put some respect on the on, on the good name of chaos magic there's a lot of good that came out of it and i think that a lot of the stuff that uh we learned at that particular juncture in occultism um is very very important uh right now and i think that everybody going out and reading a good book on chaos magic such as condensed chaos uh will do you a lot of good no matter what um your practice looks like beautiful and that's what i would i would wrap that up i have two quick follow-up questions before i ask you yes. if there's anything else you want to cover does sure. outside of the marriage practice that you talked about does christianity play any part in your life today um let me think about that for a second i don't i think the answer is no um no no, no it doesn't I, I i will say that uh I, I think that I'm, I'm interested by Catholicism. I'm interested by Christian magic. One of my, one of my people that I really consider a big mentor is um, a guy named J. Allen Cross. Um, he is a Catholic witch, a Christian witch. Um, and he has had a lot of influence on me. Um, but uh, I, so, but I think outside of just, you know, having people, um, who I really respect and learn from that, you know, kind of come more from that Christian paradigm. And aside from just being interested in learning about it inherently, because I want to learn everything I can about sure. occultism, uh, that's, that's about as far as it is. I just try to keep respect for it for the people in my life who do believe it as long as they're respectful to me. If you were talking to either a younger version of yourself or a child or a younger person in similar situations to where you're growing up, what would you tell them or advise them on? I, I would definitely tell them um, you're, you're, you're a little more clever than you think you are, or, or well, you're, you think you're a little more clever than you are rather, sorry. Sure. Um, take a step back, have a little humility and do do spells do things don't just read don't sit on your hands as much try to branch out and kind of do that experimentation a little more also i think i would just tell myself hey witchcraft's a real thing just go read like wicca for the solitary practitioner by scott cunningham or something like that's a thing that exists (laughs) that's awesome um is there anything else that you want to touch on before we before we go 
I think I, I, I think we've, we've, we have covered the gamut, man, but this has been a uh, super fun, really, really good talk with you. And I enjoyed this a lot. Awesome. For those of you who have enjoyed our talk with Dalton, uh, I'm going to link his Twitter and any other social media that he has that he'll give me um, so that you can interact with him, um, ask him questions. I'm also going to link a couple of different things. Um, uh, Storm Fairy Wolf, Crafting the Warlock, Phil Hine, Condensed Chaos, and then Jay Allen Cross. I'll have to ask about him, um, but I'll put that down below. Um, but thank you so much for being here. I greatly appreciate your time. Absolutely. You're so welcome. And thank you for having me. It's been lovely. Awesome.